Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. So my name's Leslie and I am a physio. Have we got any other physios in the room? You're sports scientists. Okay, this is going to be less data heavy. Um, and it, it's just a, a snapshot of some of the research that I've been doing. So I have worked in rugby, the sport of rugby since I qualified. So back in the mid 1980s um, when I used to run on the pitch with a bucket of water and a sponge and my job was to cut the oranges at half time and then I moved on and I worked for England rugby for 17 years uh, with the England under 20s but also consulting to the England senior team. My interest has always been in necks because those of you that will know who are strength and conditioners the nice thing about working with the academy with the under 20s is that I'd got players that came from all of the premiership clubs so I could see what they were all doing at different clubs and they all squat the same and they all bench press the same and they all did something different for their necks and it was like okay this is interesting and then the two speakers we've just had were talking about getting a common language with the coaches there's no common language in terms of neck care between the physios, the strength and conditioners, the analysts, the video analysts, the sports scientists, the players themselves. That common language just didn't seem to be there. So what I'm going to do today is to give you some insight as to the journey I've been on and I agree with the previous speaker. So I was just a physio working in the NHS but I knocked on a few doors and I went and I worked local grassroots rugby initially and then I just kept moving up the ranks um, gently until I found an England camp that needed a physio just by word of mouth and keeping my ears open and then I went in and then I asked a few challenging questions and I was lucky because the coach that was there at the time was Brian Ashton and he was a forward-looking coach and he liked the questions I was asking. I didn't just go in and do the same thing. So for the students who are in the room, just be aware that if you can get a focus of interest that's yours, that, that just challenges the norm, that's often the way forward, uh, as well as having a good, good background knowledge. And then I was fortunate because I then went into lecturing and that does give you a little bit of, of um, flexibility in your time. So what I want to do today is just to share some published research so you don't necessarily have to go and do all of that searching because I've just searched it all because I'm about, well I keep saying this, I'm about two weeks from submitting my PhD, only I've been about two weeks since October. Um, so I turned my research into proper research <laughs> eventually. Uh, I'm not going to share the whole of the PhD but I am going to share how to objectify measuring neck muscle strength so data is important making the data useful is important having that common language is important but from a physio point of view i like to say test don't guess so from a neck point of view and i i started my research with a survey to premiership rugby and and at the top of the, the game, people were still measuring neck strength by push against my hand, push against my hand, push against my hand. Oh, is it weaker on the left than the right? And then we've got handheld dynamometers. Push against the handheld dynamometer. How reliable is it? So this is where I was going. It was like, can we objectify these measurements? So I finally got published, way. It does take a long time. Um, so if you want to read this presentation, basically it's in sports, so the, the reference is there. Um, but this is where I started sort of seven years ago. We'd got people doing all sorts of neck strength activities. It, it was, it's random. It still is quite random, if I'm honest. Um, so I've still got the same question. In fact, I started this in 2002. The whole world is now interested in neck strength because of concussion. Okay, so I started this way back, but 
have only just really objectified it, which is really what I wanted to do. Um, and strength and conditioning coaches were like, oh, I don't know, is it a physio field or is it our field? We don't really strengthen the neck. We just think it will get stronger when we do an upper body session because, and, and it does, and it gets stronger through the season um, for rugby because of the training effect. And then recently I've been involved in motorsport because they're interested in neck strength. If you watch any of the Formula One programmes, you'll see that they all use like TheraBand. We'll do this. How much is that load? How are they quantifying what the neck load is? I don't know, we'll just pull against this bit of TheraBand. Um, and then I've been involved in the consensus statement from football, for the football fans in here, for heading the ball because they're relating that to concussion. And then they're saying, well, do we know how strong footballers' necks are? No, because we're not really measuring it. We might put a load cell on a, on a um, handle and then attach that to some weights. We might use the Don Gatherer system. There are systems out there for measuring it, but everybody's measuring it differently so then we haven't got a good normative database so we don't know whether somebody is strong or weak because we don't know what strong or weak is which is kind of what i said on that slide so the people who are interested at the moment judo are interested cycling are interested football are interested because of heading the ball um winter sports are really interested because there's a there's a um problem called skelly head for those of you that know about skeleton where they hurtle down a track on a tea tray um, they have real they seem to have transient um, traumatic brain injury if you like from the the vibration and uh, so they're interested uh, I can't even think about boxing I, I can't even look at the picture I, I'm not even going to go there um, so where it came from was if you read the papers that are out there about concussion, quite a lot of them hypothesized that we can change what's happening in a sport by changing the laws, which they do in rugby all the time. So they trial new laws and being involved in the under 20s, we often trialed them at our um, junior world championships. Um, so changing the scrum law, the crouch bind set so bringing them closer together so there was no axial loading making the hooker have a break foot so that the foot's forward so they don't get that load going through the top of the head through the shoulders um, you can change the laws so an external uh, way but we can also change the person so can we see what the physical characteristics are that's where we need to go into all the analysis that we've just had in the previous two talks because we'll see how fast is somebody running what is their mass we can work out their momentum we can work out can we work out the load of the collision which is what um we were talking about a minute ago you know can the can the um stat sports people tell us what the what the load is of that collision and then can you work out how strong you need to be to withstand that load without getting injured oh, so much for a physio this <laughs> so so then it for a phd i then had to take another step back and it was actually well does it matter how strong your neck is like do we know whether it matters how strong it is for those of you that know rugby and the furore that came up with the change in the law about the tackle height that recently don't know whether you're aware of that so they're saying that you have to tackle at waist height and then if you look at twitter it's like well where's the evidence to say that this will reduce the injury well, the evidence isn't really there there was a bit of a trial in france but it's not really there because that hasn't been the law so how can you have evidence for something? You've got to trial it somewhere before you can actually get, get the evidence. So there's been obviously some more work done in America because of American football, but then you can't really translate that to rugby because they wear helmets. So they've got a different, um, different game, but different protective equipment as well. However, the hypothesis is if you can generate more force through your neck muscles, you can control the acceleration of the head when you take a blow to the body. And that's what the, the research that um, is being done, like at the University of Bath, where they're trying to um, 
simulate the game and measure the forces. That's where that's coming from. So we're trying to link whether a stronger neck reduces concussion. Then comes the question of how do you know what a strong neck is? Can we actually measure it? Um, and, and this was the question that I was going around asking people. Are you measuring your athlete's neck strength? Um, and what markers are you using? So if you say I'm doing exercises to make sure the neck is strong and healthy, how do you know it's getting stronger other than the amount of weight that they can, they can maybe hold to fatigue? Um, and we've, we'd really got no normative data on any of the athletes. So I did a survey and realised that there was a lack of consensus of what was, what was going on. Um, the audit of strength, neck strength versus injury was inconsistent because nobody was really measuring neck strength, so we didn't know that. Um, we couldn't necessarily link neck strength to concussion, yet people were in published papers, but without any actual evidence to back it up. So then I came to the point of, well, we need something to measure it that's reliable. Otherwise, we can't answer any of these questions. So I went and looked at the data in the, in the literature and there were all sorts of things. So what we've got here, this was Danielle Salmon, who did really good work in New Zealand and now works with the All Blacks. And she made her own rig in the lab so that she could do what she called a simulated scrum position, although it's not really because the torso's supported on the bench. Versti uh, and then recently Farley have used the handheld dynamometer, which is obviously a good choice for in the field because it's portable, it's cheaper. Um, and they measured all the Georgian rugby players with the handheld. The gatherer system has been around a long time. That's a brake test though. So you pull until the person can't hold it anymore and then their head goes and the players don't like that particularly. A lot of rugby players play with neck pain, so they don't like that. Uh, Geary then kind of adapted that. So, and then I thought, I found the valve kit when it was the groin bar. So this is the piece of equipment that I'm saying. I don't work for Vald, but this was the kit that I thought, this works for me. Not only that, if the club had a, a groin bar, which a lot of the premiership clubs did have, they can use it for multiple things. So they can measure all the groin tests, which is what it was designed for. You, it's been used now to measure internal and external rotation ratios and strength at the shoulder. You can measure calf strength. And then I decided to adapt it and, and make it useful for, for rugby. So I got the, the testing equipment. And so this is what it looks like. Feel free to go and have a look at at lunchtime and, and have a have a play with it but basically got the kit and because the bar here rotates so here are the load cells four load cells the bar rotates so we could measure left and right side flexion and flexion and extension um, and then I thought we'd better do a reliability study really so that's what we did uh, and then it was repurposed from the groin bar and called the force frame because Vald realised how good it was and that actually it can measure multiple things therefore it might cost a little bit more but actually it's multi-purpose which is what people always want. Decided to go with the quadruped position but what that meant was that Vald actually had to make a different frame for me because my six foot seven second row players this was too small they couldn't adopt the uh, quadruped position. In fact, the team's calling it the giraffe position because they'd have their arms out here to get the second row players in the machine. So they had to, so Vald were great, they, they just made tall, a taller frame for me for the, for, with the rugby rather than the smaller frame so that we could get people in. In the quadruped position, elbows straight, hands below the shoulders, knees below the hips scapula retracted so it was repeatable so it was a, an absolutely repeatable start position 
Um, and then this is just the boring stuff of, of what my study actually was. So I did a reliability study and then I've gone on and I've now got 150 plus sets of data on Premiership and England rugby players so that I've now started to build a nice normative um, data set of rugby players. So I did my test. This is the sort of output that you get. You can see um, the strength profiles extension for the neck is always stronger than flexion and left and right side flexion hopefully are symmetrical. That's what you're, that's what you're looking for. So as one of the other speakers said, this is useful for multiple things. You can use it for normative database. You can use it for, is an academy player strong enough to move up to um, first team? You can use it for return to training after injury, return to play after injury. It's, it's a measurement that you can use as you would any other objective marker for return to play, as you would for hamstring injuries, for, for example. So for for neck injuries. The nice thing about this as well is that if you're using the handheld dynamometer, if they've got a, a shoulder injury, it's going to affect the measurement of their neck strength, not because their neck is necessarily involved, but because they can't self-administer that test. This takes that out of it. Most research into handheld dynamometers, people try to fix the handheld dynamometer so it's not held in the hand to something to make it a fixed, a fixed measurement. This just does it for you. So it takes away the uh, unpredictability of that. You don't need to look at all these numbers. All you need to see is the, the reliability, the ICC, and I've got the coefficient of vari variation in the paper, um, was good to excellent. Side flexion, a little bit more variation actually in the measurements, extension and flexion, so sagittal plane movements, much, much uh, more reliable. But we're looking at 0 0.92, 0 0.95, 0 0.90, there was right side flexion, 0 0.85 for left side flexion, uh, for test, retest. And I also did an inter-rater um, reliability test. And then something else that I did, was, oh, those are just to prove I can do scatogram. <laughs> um, that was the inter-rater reliability, uh, which was also good to excellent. But then I also put my participants on force plates and measured the force distribution through the hands because I know you can't isolate just the neck. Yeah, you're never going to do that, are you? So I just had a look to see, is the start position consistent? Uh, and it is. <laughs> basically again I won't bore you with the details because you don't need to know that you can you know I will I will publish this paper as well at some point in my life but all I'm showing is trial one and trial two are consistent at the time of through what the body's doing at the time of peak um, force through the neck in those four positions so, again, to take on board what this, the second speaker said today, so what? Yeah, what are we going to do with this data? Like, what do we care how strong the neck is? Well, what we can do now is we have a piece of kit that we know is reliable. Certainly for flexion extension, it's excellent reliability. For left and right side flexion, it's good reliability. We can now start to use that to inform practice. We can use it to determine what are good exercises that in turn, good exercises that are gonna help somebody become stronger, but we can measure whether they're getting stronger. So we can start to explore what are effective exercises for the neck. Um, I've related it to rugby. I've got lots of data on forwards and backs and, um, as opposed to young healthy males this is just in newtons uh, with the standard deviation next to it so that you can make sense of that the forwards are stronger than the backs the um and and rugby players are stronger than non-rugby players bearing in mind these are professional rugby players um but this was just a snapshot 
so this is um you know pre-season as soon as you start to get injury involved we can start to look at using it as an objective marker to return to play so we can use it in injury which is obviously from a physio where i came from but neck strength has also been related to balance so and, and neck pain to a loss of balance and if you survey a lot of rugby players you'll find that they play with neck pain a lot of the time if you look at different positions and this is where i think it hasn't been done well in rugby research generally they just split them forwards and backs well actually the the eight forwards that are on the pitch are very different from each other and certainly the seven backs that are on the pitch are different in fact i did some discriminant analysis with the rugby player data and the centers in the backs are very similar you, they could just be a, a back row player in the scrum that they in terms of neck strength so we're starting to look at qualities that the different players have in terms of neck strength that determine what what position they play which again so what? Well, it's interesting if you're looking at an academy player and then moving up to senior level and, and people changing positions. You know, we've had quite a few of the players. Um, Tom Youngs was one of them who, who was a centre when he played for us at under 20 and then went on and had a fantastic career at, at senior level as a hooker. So he, he changed positions and, and body type and position, um, composition is important for that. We're not going to do that. Um, so other considerations that I think we could put into place that we can slot neck strength into, range of motion, proprioception, balance, we can look at visual field, um, rate of force development, maybe. I'm happy to be challenged on that one um, and have that discussion because I'm not sure that that actually tells us whether that's going to um, affect incidents of concussion, for example. Um, the women's game is quite different from the men's game in rugby and women's injury patterns are quite different from men's. And what we see when we do video analysis of the women's game is that when they go down, when they get tackled, they their head hits the floor and comes back. The men don't. The men can hold their heads. And so they don't get that whiplash that the women do every time that they go down pretty much. So we need to look differently at the women's neck strength and rates of concussion and um, the etiology, really, of the injuries for the women's game as well. And then put it together with the video analysis. And then the final thing is in rugby, they're starting to wear the instrumented mouth guards to measure the impact. And we need to start to look at neck strength and the impact uh, data and see whether that impacts on injury. So if you're ever thinking that you can't think what to do for your next research project, just give me a shout because I've got about 10 lifetimes of research projects ideas in my head that I know are gaps. They're gaps in the literature and they are gaps in practice. And the, a question about how do you have this conversation with a coach? I've worked for so long in that situation where I've worked with um, the video and analysts, the, the coaches, me as the physio, the doctor. And I know that what all you need is a common language. If you can get a common language and when you ask that question and, and you were answering it and you, you also answered this, I just use colour coding for coaches. Like if they're not fit to play, they're red. If they're fit to play, they're green. If we can have a conversation about it, I'll make it amber. But it's that kind of getting that. And then we'll look at the numbers. Then we'll see, see where we're at. And I want to get neck strength into the conversation that the strength and conditioning coach has that, you know, if numbers are dropping in the gym or, or there is a, an injury where they've not hit the markers for return to training or return to play, I think this is an important factor but it needs to be incorporated um, across the board. We can't be having all these individual practices because then there's no consensus. We're never going to get there. And then here you go. This is the next then 
20 years worth of ideas, we now need to think about how are we strengthening the necks. And, and I just put a picture of the iron neck there, but when do they do the neck exercises? How are we measuring them? What are they doing? We're all doing something different, I'll tell you that for free. So have a think about what I've said. You're all, the room is disparate. There, there are people from different countries. There are people from different courses, different backgrounds. But I just want you to think about, take something away from what I've said. And if you've got any questions at ever in your, in your career and it's related to neck strength, then just remember my name and think, yeah, she knows a little bit about it. Let's progress this. But feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to answer questions. It's how I learn and also recognize where there are other gaps to think, OK, we need to maybe address that. I now work at the University of Leicester it's Seth O'Neill, who does a lot of the tendon research. So we're sort of thinking um, of combining a lot, uh, some of our research with the groups of people we're playing with. But I'm now thinking of getting, looking at grants, looking at maybe linking um, neck strength along with concussion, along with looking at motor neurone disease and sort of taking it into the neurology field a little bit, because there's a lot to be found out there, to be sure. So I've shared me, my research. We've had a think about some of the evidence that's out there. Um, have a look at the, the force frame. It really does give that reliable way of measuring neck strength and hopefully put it into some sort of context as to why I think it's important. Thank you. Before to open uh, uh, for, for questions, I'd like to make a very small, very short consideration for my students of the level six. If you have uh, listened a bit to uh, this presentation, there was an analysis of the literature to understand, obviously, the demands of the game, the important research question, or at least some aims, okay? A tool or a way to evaluate them with the reliability the aim and uh, the parameters uh, related to the aims. And after, after that, after that the data were gathered, the implementation of uh, this information into training. Okay, since the assessment is exactly the same, okay, remember obviously what this will say. So let's open the floor for questions, please. Uh, the, since before we were talking about box, uh, we have uh, an anonymous member of the audience that won a gold medal uh, uh, Olympic gold medal some years ago, so if this person wants to, to ask a question, yeah, you can. Okay, but uh, after you for the first yeah. question, yes. Well, thanks for your presentation. Um, I think finding uh, um, a tool that can help us return to play after concussion is, is, is great. Um, and what the golden nugget is, I don't know. Um, for me, it makes maybe little sense to use a neck assessment as a return to play after concussion because you will have a lot of compressive forces around the affected area. Yeah. So how do you envisage that? Do you want to put a threshold in place or do you want to... I want a baseline measurement before players have been concussed. So from a rugby point of view, I want this to become something that happens uh, pre-season. It, it won't be standalone. It won't be like, oh, neck strength will be the measurement. For, for concussion, it'll be alongside all of the other work that's happening, you know, around the cognitive load with concussion, uh, etc. But I just think that if, let me step back, we needed a way to be able to measure neck strength that was reliable. Now I've found that. We now need to look and see whether it is useful in relation to concussion, and I'm not saying necessarily that it is. So my entire PhD thesis is really not really mentioning concussion. I bring it in because it makes it alive to people because they think, well, it might be related. And if it is, great. But I take your point that actually it might not be a measure of choice post-concussion. What it will be is if we can measure concussed players and then measure their neck strength and see if the neck strength is reduced, it can be a return to training and a return to play criteria that we can use but it's not going to say whether the concussion has gone absolutely it's not
Uh, did you find that there's some uh, a specific uh, protocol of exercise that in increase the strength, uh, for example, isometric more than, uh, or there's something that you have to study again or? For exercise, yes. exercise protocol. I will have to study it again, but the players who currently some of the premiership players took it upon themselves to develop their own exercise protocols um, and I watched what they did and they usually did dynamic work against a resistance often using the iron neck which they seem to quite like so the iron neck is just the, the harness with a halo with the um, cord that's attached to the weights but the but it can slide around so they don't have to faff about to do their exercises so they tended to work through range um, and they recorded the strongest isometric maximum voluntary contraction the people who were working against resistance through range i haven't worked out how we can measure through range um, strength at the moment so i'm going with my mvic and i'm just using things like mid thigh pull as my kind of gold standard as to how i do it and, and the instructions i give but i i do think dynamic through range exercise seems to be but again i'm hypothesizing with anecdotal from what i've seen i've not measured that yet that's a next future direction do you think that uh, you're going to test uh, also the professional drivers in a uh, car or something like that? Yeah, we've already done uh, we've already done some of that at Formula 2 and also in the women's. And what we can do with the valve force frame is with the higher um, bars that we can get, so you can lift this up so that the load cells are there, you can slide a replica seat so that they are strapped in so you replicate their seated position and then the the load cells are either side and you can spin it around and drop it over so they could do flexion extension and side flexion and measure mm -hmm. them and or we can just measure them in my standard quadruped position but again um it, that seems to be something that they are very interested in and there and and hopefully going forward that will help them again with you know if they've had injuries it is different because of the fact that their torsos are restrained when they're in their in their cars Thank you. when i'm thinking about for example hamstrings uh, they are usually injured in an eccentric uh, situation and so when we assess them they we do test uh, inconcentric and eccentric mm. and we have functional righteous to kind of predict so when i'm thinking about neck i and the situation are like similar because confusions you are eccentric and when you told the fem, uh, the rugby players yeah uh, they couldn't hold the fem, um, female um, rugby players they couldn't hold his neck so also eccentric or drivers yeah also so and these kinds of assess i'm thinking I, I'm, I'm asking like just concentric yeah so so i've considered concentric and eccentric so the brake test where you pull on them until they stop that they're still measuring that isometrically rather than eccentrically so eccentrically being that when the muscles contracting as it's lengthening so this is just measuring an isometric contraction full stop it's an isometric contraction but they're making the test rather than you breaking the test if that's what you're interested in then i think you need to look at the load cell that is within a where they wear a harness get a load cell get a handle like the geary paper and then you can pull and potentially then you can measure them through range as they resist they can pull away and do an eccentric load this won't be able to do that this is absolutely going to be an isometric test do we have another question or time for the last before we have the lunch break yes please thank you um, i'm not a rugby guy i have to say that but i pay a lot of attention to American football and in many situations they receive the heat where in moments where they are not activating yeah. their neck muscles yeah. and for me these are the most dangerous situations yeah. because they are not prepared so do 
What's your opinion on yeah. how to prepare an athlete for that particular situation? It's a brilliant question and that is why I said I'm not really I don't think that I care about rate of force development because I don't think that they have the ability to, you know, go, oh, I'm, I'm hit, I must contract my muscles now. So the only way that in my mind, from coming from a physio background, that we're making a difference there is if we hypertrophy the muscles, so, so we make the muscles able to create more force, we increase the natural stiffness of the neck. So the bigger the muscle, the the more stiffness we've got between the 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 vertebra um, then potentially we're conferring some sort of protective factor on that neck because it's bigger and therefore can protect itself because the muscles can produce that um, protective force so if you think of something like sternocleidomastoid, which doesn't even attach to the neck, as you know, because it attaches to the sternum, the clavicle and the skull, um, those are the muscle and, and upper traps, those are the muscles that are really contracting there as you're, as you're sort of actively um, pushing against the force frame. However, the little segmental muscles like multifidus, erector spiny, longus colli, etc. If you're doing neck training, they are going to, to get stronger, create more force. They don't, they're not really the mobility muscles. They're just intersegmental. They're the stability muscles. So they're going to confer some additional stability to the spine by getting stronger but not in a conscious way, just that they are going to confer some stability because they're, they're better prepared, because they're stronger. So you mean training stabilizers more than training primary movers? I think training both, and I've always said this, so my master's um, dissertation was looking at proprioception of the spine and I used the Vicon motion analysis and looked at head repositioning accuracy and that was my stabilising muscles that were working. They've got so many mechanoreceptors telling the head where it is in space and I think the better trained they are, the better balanced you are, you know where your head is in space. People like yeah, yeah, people who can run with the ball and sidestep and not fatigue, they're the people who are going to have the best trained neck muscles, in my opinion. So I think there's a performance enhancement element as well as an injury prevention element to training the neck. And I think the same in football. I just don't think it's been explored.